You are listening to Social Europe Podcast. We discuss cutting-edge thinking on politics, economy and employment and labour with some of the most thought-provoking people around, including Nobel Prize winners and other internationally acclaimed experts. So welcome and enjoy the conversation. This episode of Social Europe Podcast is brought to you by the Zaid Business School, University of Oxford. Maximize your effectiveness in the changing global business environment with a postgraduate Oxford Diploma in Global Business. Taught in four short modules over a year, the program is designed to accelerate your career and increase your impact while minimizing the disruption to your work and family life. Learn alongside senior executives from around the world and develop a lifelong network. Visit the Oxford Diploma in Global Business website to find out more. All right, David Weber, thank you very much indeed for taking the time today uh, to talk to me about the topic of your most recent book, uh, The Rise of the Working Class uh, Shareholder. And uh, by way of background, uh, can we maybe just briefly revisit how this sort of Marxian traditional relationship between sort of labor and capital seems, that borderline seems to have blurred in, uh, in, 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 in the meantime. So what has happened from your point of view? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for inviting me here. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, so, you know, I think if you go back traditionally, uh, that that particular worldview was, well, labor is on one side of the chasm, capital is on the other side of the chasm. There's inherent conflict between them, and, and to some extent there is, but there's this inherent conflict between them, and you're sort of on one side or the other, and what side you fall on kind of determines a lot about how you're supposed to function, where your interests lie, and so on and so forth. But the reality is, is what we've seen uh, around the world, around the developed world over the last several decades is the rise of basically labor's capital. Uh, I'm not the first to use that term, by the way. Uh, Teresa Ghilarducci used that term. I use it a little bit differently than it's been used before. But the basic idea is that uh, uh, we've seen the rise of shareholding and share owning by labor. Uh, in the United States, that manifests in two particular ways. One is in the form of public pension funds, which invest the retirement savings of public sector workers, folks who work for the state, the city, the county, and to a smaller extent, but still important, in private sector labor unions, what we've seen is their investment funds, their retirement funds, I should say, are invested in the market. And this is to some extent paradoxically, to some extent uncomfortably, but I also think critic of critical importance in the 21st century is that these folks have quietly become quite powerful and influential shareholders, and they're increasingly turning, and I encourage them to continue and to expand, turning to the shareholder power that they have in this retirement funds to get what they want. And uh, as far as I can see, there are basically two types of how laborers became shareholders. The one is that you just mentioned that, you know, uh, cumulatively uh -huh. uh, by their pension uh, uh, contributions, they, they become quite big capitalists and uh, their portfolio managers become quite uh, powerful. But on the individual level, there's always been also been the rise of uh, what I think Richard Freeman calls uh, the workers share. Actually, the workers own part of the company they actually they actually work in. Uh, so exactly. beyond the, the the capital element of this, do you see that you know the individual shareholders or the workers share uh, can also be used for sort of exerting shareholder power in a company? I think it's possible. Uh, I think it's certainly possible, and we've already started to see examples of that. So recently, for example, a number of uh, employees at Amazon who were also shareholders of Amazon filed shareholder proposals at Amazon to try to get the company to do more about environmental issues. Uh, we've seen um, uh, recently in Boston a company called Wayfair had a walkout by employees who were upset about some of the company's practices. And they also identified themselves very clearly when they approached management, not just as workers, but as shareholders in the company. So yes, I do think that that's a possibility. Um, however, uh, at the moment, at least in the US, and uh, a lot of the power that I'm talking about is really invested in these pension funds, which are not so much um, uh, in the relationship you just described about a worker owning stock in their own company, what those are is state workers, city workers, or certain unionized workers who have diversified investment portfolios. And so they own 
a piece of everything almost. And so they are exercising not necessarily just their power. Sometimes they're not employees at the company. Far from it, they're public employees. They're public sector employees still in a position to exercise worker shareholder voice from that perspective. So you're right. There's different shifting ways um, of, of looking at this issue. Most of my focus has been on these pension and union funds, but both, I think, are very important. And if we come to the to the pension funds, I mean, one often heard uh, criticism about uh, shareholder activism or the lack of it is that in many cases, you as an individual contributor to a pension fund don't even know in what kind of shares your, your money eventually ends up being invested. So how would you see that mechanism work that these sort of big commu cumulative funds can actually be used for sort of activist purposes? So this is a critically important point. So one one debate that we're having in the United States right now, and we certainly lag behind Germany, uh, for example, on this issue is the question of worker representation on corporate boards. We know that Senator Elizabeth Warren and also Senator Bernie Sanders have made proposals that would allow for workers to be put on corporate boards. Um, but at the moment, we don't have that in the United States. Interestingly, though, where we do have that, where we've had that for decades, is on the pension fund side. So uh, even though we don't have this on the investee side, in the corporation, it's true that workers within the corporation don't have voice or representation on the corporate board. On the investor side, for these pensions that we were just talking about, they actually do. So in many of these state pension plans, city pension plans, for those workers, you have members of those boards of trustees who are themselves workers elected by peer workers to represent their interests in the pension fund, in the retirement fund. Now, there's a lot of variation there. and We could get into, we could get into some real uh, granular detail, which probably isn't necessary. But some of these pensions have majority worker control. Some have minority. Some have 50-50, which is what happens at the federal level. So there is some variation. But this is one of the mechanisms by which workers have been able to solve the problem that you just described. Because it's true. The reality is it's too much for any individual. When you're in a diversified investment portfolio where you own thousands of stocks, okay, most of us, it's it's almost like the same, it's the same concept of representative government, essentially. It's just representative uh, representatives on your pension. So what you do is you elect folks to act in your interest, to make sure that the pension fund is being managed in the interests of the workers who are contributing to it. That's how we do that in the United States. That's one excellent way of doing it. There is some research, by the way, that has shown that these particular types of board representatives uh, actually do better than the, than the alternative. What's the alternative? And I should say, who else is on these boards? The other half of these boards typically are political and political appointees. So the state governor. Uh, the city mayor will appoint uh, his or her representatives to these pension boards. And so you've got a mix. And I should just add one more point here. Um, these folks are also voters, right? They're not just pensioners. They also vote in those gubernatorial elections. They vote in that mayoral election. And so sometimes what happens is, is they actually have pretty strong voice, not even just through their own representatives, but also because some, in some states, like New York and others, the public sector unions are actually still quite strong and politically involved. So they are actually capable of exercising voice over those pensions, not even just through their own direct representatives who are elected to them, but also on the employer side, because they're po important players in some states and cities, they're important players on the political side of the spectrum too. So that's how these folks have been able to exercise voice in ways that are really, I think, very interesting and critically important for us to understand in advance to the extent we care about, to those of us who care about workers and labor in the 21st century, uh, I think it's a, an important thing to be thinking uh, and building on. And uh, do you think that the potential political power that can be exerted via these funds is directly related to the size of it? So is it the bigger you are, uh, you know, the more potential power you have? So should there be some sort of fund of funds just to pool that kind of power? Uh, I think that size is an important factor. Um, certainly, 
major players like CalPERS. So CalPERS is probably CalPERS and CalSTRS are a couple of the most famous. CalPERS is the California Public Employee Retirement System. It has two million members who contribute to it, and it has, last I checked, three hundred and fifty billion dollars in assets. Right across the river in Sacramento, the state capital of California, there's also CalSTRS, which isn't far behind. That's the California State Teachers Retirement System with something 200 something billion in assets. So yes, I do think that to some extent, I don't want to overstate the case, yes, to some extent, size does matter. The bigger you are, the more shares you own, right? We all know that to some extent, um, your shareholder voice is proportional to the shares that you own. Um, and therefore, size can have an impact. That having been said, um, the willingness to exercise shareholder voice, regardless of size, is also critically important. And one of the things that I show in my book is that there are a number of relatively small unions, like the United Brotherhood of Carpenters Union, okay, in the United States, um, which in terms of the size of its retirement funds is not particularly large. But because they have been willing to exercise their shareholder voice, for example, by filing I think last I checked over 700 shareholder proposals to push for majority voting rules at companies, they have been able to exercise outsized voice because they're willing to exercise it. A lot of folks are very passive, very quiet. And so uh, certainly size helps. And I do like the idea of, you know, the more you could do pooling uh, there. This raises all sorts of interesting potential antitrust issues that can get very complicated. But yes, I think that that it is true. Let's face it. Norway uh, is an important player because of its size, right? The Norwegian, uh, the government pension fund of Norway. So size does matter. Size does have an effect. But there are folks who've been able to ex wield voice, even though they're not that large. And uh, that leads to an interesting question. I mean, we've had a discussion here a few years ago that to an extent still goes on uh, now that you mentioned Norway is about sovereign wealth funds and, and, and how uh, basically the state can be state capitalist and exerting influence. Do yeah. you see that kind of potential activist role for pension funds just in terms of minority stakes? Or could it be possible that you let literally take over a, a majority in a specific company, which gives you all sorts of power, obviously, to change the direction of a specific company? One of the most interesting developments on the horizon right now has been CalPERS, which I mentioned earlier, the California Public Employees Retirement System, uh, their uh, exploration of creating their own private equity fund. Now, historically, Historically, you're quite right. Historically, these in pension funds have been passive investors. They've been diversified investors. And for, for, all, for all the obvious reasons, they should remain diversified investors. Nevertheless, it's also the case that these funds now, like CalPERS and others, are some of them are so large that they actually could, they, have, they already have been increasing their allocations to, say, private equity and to hedge funds and such. Which, are, which is itself a controversial topic. Nevertheless, right, where they're making those kinds of investments and CalPERS is considering creating its own private equity fund raises precisely the issue that you just described, which is, are there situations where they might capitalize their own funds and start to outright own their own companies? You know, uh, just to the north of us, our Canadian neighbors, some of the Ontario funds have done that. They have had private equity funds where they have owned outright uh, certain companies. And I think while I would, I, I would like to see that uh, development, uh, I think if you do it right and if it's done with a degree of sophistication, it could be good. I would also though firmly say that overall, we want these pension funds to remain diversified. The bottom line is that they have to provide retirement funds to their members at low cost over a long time horizon and to date, uh, the ability for individuals to outperform the market is uh, highly questionable. So overall, I would say yes. I, I, overall, I would say stick with diversification and, and to some extent have a lot of indexing going on. 
But I, I think we could see some more developments along the lines you just described. Yeah, I mean, because if you just do it in one particular company and make it work, you can basically create a model. I mean, here in Germany, we, we sometimes have the discussion about if you look at Volkswagen, you know, for all scandals, still the world's largest producers of cars, uh, it's 20% yep. state owned. All right. Yep. So obviously, and, and even amongst the uh, amongst the shareholders, there is a, there are a lot of sovereign wealth funds invested uh, in the in the other eighty percent that are not controlled by the state of, of Lower Saxony. So uh, I mean, if you just uh, and and obviously that hasn't prevented them from becoming world leaders in their in the in their market. So you can yep. make an interesting uh, sort of role model case out of. Uh, actually taken over one specific company for specific purposes. But at the same time, obviously, uh, you're absolutely right. And, you know, maybe you can dwell a bit more on this potential conflict of interest uh, that, of course, you can take, um, you can use that kind of capital position to take political decision also to decide in what kind of companies you invest in and, and what kind of companies you don't invest in, like fossil fuel driven companies and things like that. But at the same time, your primary purpose is to build a good return uh, and increase the size of the fund so you you can provide decent pensions for your contributors. So uh, how do you see that kind of conflict play out? So one thing that I think is it, one one model that I think is it shouldn't necessarily exclusively be the model, but I think probably should be the dominant model is that you have a diversified investment portfolio, essentially an indexed fund, you know, funds that own, you know, thousands of companies and that remain diversified and indexed, and then they're active within the index. Okay, so um, there are different forms. This kind of gets into the question of sort of um, divestment versus engagement debate, right? And this has been a longstanding debate in this area, right? When you want to be active, how do you send a signal? How do you create change as a shareholder? The do I think in the popular imagination and in the pop and the public discourse, divestment always seems, you know, the way to go. And I I would never take that off the table. But one of my main concerns about divestment, to me, it's almost like uh, um, saying, well, I don't like the way the political system is going, so I'm not going to vote. You know, the problem is when you don't vote, you cease to exercise your voice and the voices of others fill that vacuum. Uh, and this is the type of concern that I have about about divestment, for example, um, which is that, well, when you when you up and sell your stakes and walk away, who are you selling your shares to? And are they likely to be more or less concerned about issue X than you are? Because as a shareholder, you can vote against the CEO's pay. You can file shareholder proposals to get the company to change course on environmental issues, on governance issues, on labor issues. You can bring lawsuits. You have all sorts of rights and powers and voice as a shareholder that you surrender when you cease to be one. So one of the things that we have seen emerge with some of these large pension funds, for example, I describe in the book a campaign by New York City's pension funds. So New York City has uh, also, you know, it has a significant, it has $190 billion in assets. It's a significant player. What type of strategies have they adopted in terms of activism? Well, within the index, owning thousands of companies that they do, one thing that they have done is taken this, you might call it, this is usually a pejorative term, but I don't mean, mean it pejoratively, one size fits all approach to reform which is to say, look, we own the whole portfolio. We're the universal owners. We basically own the whole market. And so the types of issues that you look, some activists will look at specific companies and say, how do I make this change at this particular company? Okay, that's one model. But another model is, to, is the portfolio level, which is to say, I own a portfolio of thousands of stocks. What kind of changes do I want to see across the portfolio that will benefit my members and that will have significance, you know, broadly speaking, and not just at one particular company? And so, for example, now we've seen environmental proposals being filed by the New York City pension funds at many, many different companies, at hundreds of different companies. They moved for governance reforms to try to stop corporate management from insulating themselves from any outside voice um, by pursuing things like proxy access, which I could get into if it's of interest, things like that. 
That's a kind of model of activism that's more structural than it is specific to particular companies. It's like, here are the problems we see across the portfolio. What steps can we take to improve them across the portfolio? And that's a way, that's a kind of activism where you remain an investor and you remain engaged and you, you, you utilize the significant shareholder power that you have um, to make such changes. And I try to document how that works in the book and why I think, why I think it's one successful model uh, for moving forward. But you're right, to come back to your conflict question, um, how do we deal if we assume that a worker is two things in this world, a worker is someone who makes money from selling their labor, and a worker is also a shareholder, there are conflicts sometimes between returns and between um, maximizing your interest as a laborer. Now, sometimes those conflicts are overstated. Uh, it's not always the case, and there's been plenty of research on this that paying workers less improves returns. That's a fallacy. That's not, I don't mean to suggest it's always better to pay workers more, it's more complicated than that. But first of all, you can look at it from that perspective. Secondly, from my, one of the arguments that I make is that the current legal regime in the United States only prioritizes returns, essentially, or tries to. This is itself a very heated debate, but there is certainly a strong a constituency out there, a uh, pretty right-wing constituency, sort of free market oriented, that says the law requires these pension trustees only to think about shareholder returns, and they have to ignore every other interest. And I have made a legal argument suggesting that that's not true, that's not what the statute requires, nor is it actually in the economic interests of these workers. Let me give you an example, some of the worst examples of the conflict uh, that you just pointed to. Um, I mentioned earlier that some of these public pension funds have invested in, in private equity funds. And I actually interviewed someone in the book who is a custodian at a public school in Massachusetts, not too far from where we are right now. He had been working, making $20 an hour, uh, working as a, a, a custodian. He was unionized. And his retirement fund went into a pension fund. And that pension fund turned around and invested in private equity. And private equity was owning, bought this company called Aramark. What does Aramark do? Aramark provides services to schools and prisons, by the way, which tells you something about their business model, right? So they, what do they do? They come, they show up at Chelmsford, they underbid this custodian's union for the school's contract, and they offer him his own job back for $8.50 an hour. So here is a guy who is directly invested out of his own job with his own retirement fund. And the trustees in that situation, the pension trustees say, well, wait a minute. Our job was just to maximize returns, and it was a good investment. Well, the point is that these folks actually directly undermine the economic interests of this person who they're supposed to be fiduciaries to by investing him out of his own job. So my argument has always been, Put all the interests on the table. Consider the worker's interest as a worker. Consider the worker's interest as a shareholder. That gives us the best, most totalizing picture of their economic interest. And then you should be able to make investment decisions accordingly. I'm not saying it's easy, it's complicated, but that's what, this, that's what the standard should be. And I think that's the best way to manage these conflicts. Most of you might decide. I'd, I'd rather take the returns, even if it hurts my job, if the returns are good enough, right? And vice versa, you might say, forget the returns, let's do something else. Uh, really, we, we do care about the economic interest of these folks, but we have to look at that rashly and broadly and holistically and not in a narrow way. So basically your argument, which to my mind makes perfect sense, is that you, you really need to look at the whole value chain uh, and, and not just stop at, you know, you have a diversified investment portfolio and that's the kind of return after cost uh, on an annual basis. But you really need to look closely how this return was actually made. Uh, because it could undermine the, the original intention uh, of, of the investment in the first place. Even people, even the, the folks who say you should maximize returns always, forever, first and last, those folks 
make that argument based on the idea that that is what is maximally in the economic interest of the people you're investing for. Well, that's plainly not true in many circumstances. And I think that that's, that's a powerful argument that folks who are sympathetic to this perspective need to be making again and again. And, you know, conversely, let's say you shift to the political side of these questions. You shift to the economic inequality questions. You shift to the environmental and to the labor questions. Well, from my perspective, and um, from my perspective, where are these decisions being made? Are they being made in Washington? Are they being made in Berlin and London? Well, to some extent, but they're often being made in corporate boardrooms. Those are the where the, those are the places where these decisions that are affecting us in terms of labor and in the environment and other issues are being made. And just like you wouldn't say, oh, we shouldn't participate in the political system because we're not happy or it's compromising or whatever, I think the same argument is to be made uh, in the corporate boardroom and in the marketplace, right? Which is, you've got to have voice in that corporate boardroom. And if you're not a shareholder, you don't have voice. You're not in the room where the decisions that are affecting this issue that you most care about are being made. And uh, yeah, an interesting point probably for, for people who now think, you know, how can we adapt that kind of model to our circumstances? Uh, what you already alluded to, and you, you, you offer to dwell on a bit more, which I want uh, want you to do if, if possible. What were, you know, from your research, the most promising techniques to actually exercise that kind of uh, uh, working class shareholder influence? So there, it, 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 to some extent, the answer is context specific. So we'll look at a couple different contexts. One would be when you're a diversified investor investing in publicly held companies, like owning stock in Microsoft and so on and so forth, right? That's one context. And then a different context would be, say, when you're doing private equity fund investments or hedge fund investments. And I think the strategies and the way of thinking are different depending upon those contexts. So if we start with the public, uh, publicly held companies indexing, owning uh, portions of the stock market, some of the activism that we've seen there basically takes two forms. One of it is sort of topic selection, subject selection, and then the other is, you know, winning, for lack of a better way of putting it. So one way that a lot of these investors, like, say, the New York City pension funds and others, uh, I think established credibility and all, is that they picked issues that were in the interests of their, their members, sure, but that could also find support among other investors. So take some of the governance issues, something like proxy access. Right, so proxy access is technical, but I think incredibly important. What is proxy access? Imagine if you're, you know, the next presidential election uh, in 2020. Imagine if, um, well, anybody could run against the incumbent, but only the incumbent could have his name on the ballot in in the voting booth. If you wanted to run against the current president of the United States, you could. You just have to print up all your own ballots mail them to millions and millions of voters with your name on it and get them to bring those ballots with them to the polls, right? Well, if that happened in a US presidential election, that would be flatly unconstitutional. But that is precisely the way corporate elections in the United States have happened for many, many decades. Sure, you wanna run against the board, you have a right as a shareholder to vote in that election, you have a right in the shareholder meeting, you can run against the board. It's just we're not going to put your dissident name on the ballot, which is the proxy. Every year in the U.S., before the shareholder meeting, companies have to send out these ballots that are called proxies that inform so that shareholders are um, sufficiently well informed to vote at the shareholder meeting. Right? That's governed by securities law. That's what the proxy is. And forever in this country, companies have refused to do the simple thing of just listing the names of their own opponents on that same proxy. What does that mean? As a result, this stupid little technical voting issue has insulated board members in this country from real meaningful electoral challenge for decades because it's irrational, economically irrational, for any one fund, 
which may only own a small, if it's diversified, it may only own a small percentage of company A. It's not rational for them to spend millions of dollars to print up their own ballots, to circulate those to investors, to get them to bring them to the meeting and vote them. And as a result, that has been a mechanism of keeping shareholder voice in the United States, something that has existed only on paper, but is not meaningful. Well, New York City came along, and I could I could really bore bore you with, with details. It was adopted. Finally, the pensions pushed forward and got it in Dodd Frank, and then the uh, 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 the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals overruled the SEC and didn't allow the rule to be implemented. Long story short, New York City pension funds took this on as an issue, and they went company by company and said, "You should adopt proxy access for." Uh, shareholders who've owned the company, 3% of the company for three years or more, and with certain other limitations. And the bottom line, to get to the bottom line, is they started with 75 companies in the first year, and they were wildly successful. At the beginning of this process, something like five out of the 500 S&P 500 companies had proxy access. Now, it's, 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 it's well over 90%. I don't even know what the latest number is. And it's because of a campaign like this to increase the shareholder voice that was led by the New York City pension funds. And, and, and just out of interest, I mean, what was the excuse if the whole ideology behind this is maximize shareholder value? And uh, how can you justify so obviously shutting out <laughs> shareholders from uh, these very important, uh, you know, corporate constitutionally important elements uh, for the company? What is the excuse? Their argument was always, that, well, there's a lot, a lot of different games that go on here, but their basic excuse was, well, the shareholders are really outsiders. They're not in a position to know what's going on inside the company. Uh, the board is, and therefore, they shouldn't get this kind of voice. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's, it's totally flimsy. Um, uh, you know, corporate side lobbies like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the Business Roundtable are the ones that sued to stop this from happening. Uh, and got it. They got it struck down at the, at, 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 in court. It's just that New York City fought back in this particular way, and it worked. So right, I mean, it's just it's just a, it's a naked power grab. Um, but right, their justification was ju oh the other thing interest very interesting. What they argued in court, successfully in court, unsuccessfully in, in front of shareholders, was that special interest groups would come in and use this power. Um, and they specifically attacked public pension funds and labor union funds and said these funds are going to use it to advance their own special interests. And one of the interesting things is after they successfully got it struck down in court um, at, the, at, the, at the legal level, shareholders voluntarily adopted these things knowing that they were brought by these very so-called special interest groups. So it was a very interesting game that was go going on there. Um, so that's one model. New York City has now moved on to bringing issues about global warming, about trying to get companies to disclose more of what they know about global warming. There has been a lot of activism. They, For example, a few years ago, a scientist was successfully put onto the board of Exxon. Exxon, whatever you may think of Exxon, they know a lot about global warming. They probably they, they may know more about it than any of the rest of us do, right? In terms of the access to information that they have on the inside, right? So, picking issues like that, you know, the, a global warming issue that's that's across your portfolio. I mean, obviously, it matters more in certain types of investments than in others, but it's really a, a critical issue everywhere. It illustrates precisely the kind of thing that I was talking about. Now, that was a bit long-winded, but I want to get to the other parts of your question. I should say that these pension funds and labor funds that I describe own about 10% of the U.S. stock market. Okay, now, um, and if you if you account, it gets much bigger if you account entities like Vanguard and BlackRock and others, which I actually don't count. I'm being conservative for a variety of reasons we can get into, uh, but in certain other contexts, so 10%, it should be higher, of course. But it's actually large enough to undertake a lot of the activism that I describe in the book. In other contexts, though, it's even bigger. So if you look at private equity, which has become such a force globally, 
The most conservative estimate would say that these public pension funds and labor funds, these labor's capital institutions, the most conservative estimate would say that they, that they invest about a third. About a third of private equity's assets under management is from public pension funds and labor union funds, and the number is almost certainly higher. Some have put that number closer to 50%. Now, on the one hand, this raises all the promise and perils of labor's capital. Because on the one hand, I gave you the Aramark example earlier. On the, one, on the one hand, you could say, this is how labor's own power gets used against it, because you've got private equity doing bad things to workers and using worker money to do it. But part of what I try to illustrate in the book, because this is true, this does happen. I, I admit it happens. But what has also happened is that at least some subset of sophisticated activists who work in this space as basically labor's capital activists, capital strategists for labor, have flipped it. Because the reality is, is that when a minimum of a third of your assets under management come from public pension funds, that's life and death for you as a private equity company. And, and what has happened is some of these activists have turned have flipped the script really in a way and have said, listen, you want our money? You better not do X, Y, and Z. I'll give you some examples. Um, New York City, I've talked about them a lot, recently adopted a responsible contractor policy, which basically says when we make real estate investments, when we make um, infrastructure investments, you're gonna have to pay workers on those projects fair wages and benefits. You can't hire contractors who have a terrible safety track record, for example. You want our money? That's what you have to do. Otherwise, we're not investing. Well, after that, the building trades union approached Blackstone, BlackRock, Carlisle, KKR, go down the list. And to make a long story short, many of those funds have now applied the policy to their own infrastructure and real estate investments. So for example, right now, JFK Airport, John F. Kennedy Airport in New York City is rebuilding Terminal 1 of that airport. It's being That's a job being done with union labor. Why is it being done with union labor? Well, part of the reason, um, and, and, and there's many other examples of this, um, uh, is because they have investments from an entity called Ulico, the Union Labor Life Insurance Company, which is an entity that makes investments like this and requires that you hire union labor in those investments, alongside Carlisle, a private equity fund. They're making these investments and they're hiring union labor. And this kind of thing is starting to spread around the United States. Now, I recognize this is an optimistic story, but one I think can tell an optimistic but still plausible story, a virtuous circle story, where what you have is pensions investing in projects where you hire union labor. Those are fair wages and benefits paid to those workers who then do what? Pay benefits into their pension funds, right? So you have both the return on investment and potentially new workers contributing into pension funds. And so one, uh, one can tell a plausible, optimistic, but still plausible story that this could be one way to revive labor in the U.S. and elsewhere in the 21st century, which is these kinds of investments that create good jobs and also new pension contributors. After all, pensions are funded not just from returns. Returns matter, but they're also funded from employee and employer contributions. And so the context, there's another one I could go on about hedge funds, but I've been talking for several minutes. So Different strategies can apply in different contexts. And I think in the private equity context, because pensions are make up such a more uh, such a larger percentage of the assets under management, they have proportionally even more voice in that space. And uh, you know, interestingly, from these uh, sort of two sides of the examples that you presented, one why the, the normal type of shareholding and the one 
uh, the other via private equity. Uh, it seems to be that the kind of shareholding element seems to be conducive to trying to enforce differences in corporate governance. Uh, whereas private equity, the, the example that you mentioned, uh, was a way to basically enforce standards, some certain standards in procurement, for instance. Um, and uh, it would be an interesting question. I mean, from, from your point of view, have uh, labor unions seen the strategic uh, potential of, of this type of uh, uh, in you know activist capitalism in the sense because quite feasibly if uh, if that sort of um, shareholder activism can lead to changes in corporate governance uh, not least could you set an incentive to actually allow for your, for organize, organizing and unionization uh, which in many private companies is is a problem so you know could you could you use this as an entry point to actually more structurally, also in corporate governance mechanism, uh, increase the, the voice of labor and unions? I think yes and no. Uh, I think, first of all, some of the unions in the United States and some of the pensions in the United States really get it. I think some of them really are sophisticated about it, understand the potential of this tool, use it in the right way, are realistic about it. Others are totally asleep at the switch, um, turn over their money, without thinking about how it's really being used. And I think the hope, of course, is to uh, to build on the, the former and to reduce the latter. There have been, look, there's a, there's a, there, there, are, there have been fierce fights about these kinds of issues. I think that the antitrust laws in the past in the United States in some ways have been really, have been used to try to sever these two forces from each other with some success. So some of the funds have had to be careful about, let's say, I mean, but but they're still doing it. I mean, some of the funds have been careful, like if you're a union and you have unionized workers and then you go on strike at this particular company and then you simultaneously use the union pension fund to go after the board as a shareholder, this is, I will say, it's tricky. I, I mean, I, I personally don't think there should be anything, any any issue with that. There have been some, uh, you know, it, it is true. It is true to pay, play devil's advocate for a second. We don't want a scenario where people are just running around playing politics with other folks' pensions, right? We do, you know, we all want to save the world, but it's one thing to try to, you know, one thing to, you know, there's some, there are other issues at stake, of course, right? You have to fund the retirement of, of these folks. I think we need to move the legal ball a little bit in this country on some of these issues. Um, so I think there's a, there are a lot of, um, what's the bottom line? My bottom line is yes, the, as you just described it, your, the, the tool is, as you just laid it out, could be used in that way. Whether there's the will to use them in that way, how, how, what kind of backlash might it trigger, those are also very real questions. But nevertheless, we're seeing it happening. We're seeing it happening in the private equity space. And it's sort of, from my perspective, it has to happen. I, because I don't, you know, and this is what I've spoken to a lot of union groups. I've spoken to a lot of pension groups. And the reality is, is that unions in the United States and around the world and in Europe and elsewhere, they have electoral strategies. They have legislative strategies. They have litigation strategies. They've got to have capital strategies for the reasons that we said earlier. If you don't have capital strategies, but it's, you know, the facts on the ground are being created in markets. They're being created in companies and they're being created in markets. By the time you win that rare sweeping election that enables you to pass some sterling new piece of legislation and then hopefully get it through the courts and so on and so forth. You know, the facts on the ground have been generated, I mean, long ago. And I'm not saying that those things are unimportant. Of course, electoral strategies matter. Of course, legislative strategies matter. But capital strategies operate upstream from all of that. And they, ha they just have, they have to be part of the picture because if you take a realistic look at the world we're living in and you care about the environment and you care about labor and you care about economic inequality, to, to do that and ignore this space is just 
frankly, it's not to really care about those issues, because if you really do care about those issues, this is the space in which which is shaping them more than any, any other, in my view. Yeah, you use that muscle if you if you have the ability to use it. And that, that it's a nice uh, sort of segue into the final question, because you've already been talking for almost 45 minutes. I mean, <laughs> um, what would you, you know, based on your very uh, innovative analysis, really, uh, I mean, for decision makers in the public policy area, uh, or in unions, uh, you already uh, mentioned one lack of strategic dimension, which is, you know, you have all these dimensions where you make strategic uh, or work up strategies, but you don't have a capital uh, uh, strategy. Uh, what would you summarize as maybe the three key takeaways? So what, what should be the, key t uh, the three key takeaways and what should actually the action uh, should be that follows from these uh, key takeaways? I think the number one key takeaway is you have to have collective shareholder voice. If you have collective shareholder voice, if you have worker representation exercising that shareholder voice, those are some those are absolutely critical, I think, for the 21st century, for the future of labor and workers and economic inequality issues, environmental and so forth. Okay. What's the antithesis of collective shareholder voice? In the United States, we would call it the 401k. The 401k is an individually managed retirement account. The 401k, we used to have corporate pensions in the United States, like we have in the public sector, which was basically your guarantee to fixed payment in retirement every month. Okay, that's what it used to be. That's almost gone in the private sector, replaced with an individual investment account that's tax favored. And so whatever is still, you make those investments over your lifetime and whatever's left in the account is what you have to retire on. And that's the way it is. Well, one aspect of that individually managed account is that it utterly silences your shareholder voice. When you are one individual, to me, the soundbite that I often use in this context is that a traditional pension is like a union. And a 401k is like what we call right to work in the United States. So what do I mean by that? When you're part of a pension, a traditional pension, that is a collective pooled assets, like CalPERS and CalSTRS, and you, okay? When you're part of a collective pension, even if individually your particular retirement fund is quite small, as part of that collective, you have massive shareholder voice. That's why CalPERS and New York City and others are able to exercise that shareholder voice to the benefit of the folks who contribute to them, right? But in the 401k model, you're one individual investor. You have no collective voice. Oftentimes, you know, your, your money is turned over to a mutual fund, and I, don't, I won't get into all the details of that, but for a variety of reasons, those mutual funds are very compromised in terms of the activism that they're willing to engage in relative to these pensions and labor union funds, okay? And so to me, a pension is like a union and the 401k is like what we call right to work. If you're an individual worker with, who's not part of a union, good luck. And you go to your boss and you say, I want to raise and I don't like my working conditions. They say, good luck, there's the door, goodbye, right? When you're part of a union, you have some collective voice. The same principle implies in the investment space. When you're part of a collective investment entity, you collectively have massive shareholder voice. What's going on right now is an effort in the United States to smash and scatter these last remaining big pensions into millions of individually managed 401ks. To me, this is the same thing as, strike, as going after unions. It's the same principle. You smash and scatter these collective entities and make it all about the individual they lose all their voice and management gains the upper hand. Same principle. You smash and scatter these collective investment vehicles into millions of individually managed accounts, you smash the shareholder voice. So I think we have to stop that from happening in the United States. I think we need to spread these collective shareholder vehicles. And I think we need to make sure that we have worker voice on them. So it's one thing, if you have a collective investment vehicle, but then only the employers have the voice. Well, that you know, well, you see the point, right? What you need is worker voice on these pensions. You need collective voice. You need to stop this individualization uh, uh, of 
of, of investor power. Um, because those of us who are individual investors like me, like many of us who get our pensions through universities or others uh, where we don't have that voice, right? I, I feel like I benefit from the voice, the collective shareholder voice wielded by the likes of New York City and CalPERS and so on and so forth. So we're all benefiting from it. But if we all get 401k, we lose that voice. So collective shareholder voice with worker representation on those boards and utilized in ways that uh, advance the interests of workers, making sure you have a legal structure that facilitates that. Those would be my, my three takeaways. David Weber, thank you very much indeed for taking the time. I, I think that was a very fascinating discussion how sort of uh, the rise of working class shareholders could actually lead the way to some sort of working class, uh, more favorable working class capitalism. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invite. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you don't miss future episodes by subscribing to Social Europe Podcast. You can also read our articles on www.socialeurope.eu and follow us on Facebook and on Twitter at Social Europe. Until next time. <laughs>